You know, just a few days ago, we celebrated July 4th, Independence Day, the day in 1776 that the Declaration of Independence was adopted by the Continental Congress. You know, I think it's important that we do celebrate the many freedoms that we have in the United States, but most importantly, do we celebrate the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus that is offered to all of humanity. In reality, the fact is, there is not freedom apart from God. God's provision for our spiritual freedom is found only in His Son, Jesus Christ. And so, this morning I am going to talk a little bit about some history in our country, but only as an illustration to point to a deeper truth of freedom in Christ. I want to begin by reading a prayer from the Reverend Peter Marshall, who was years ago the chaplain to the U.S. Senate. So, will you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, Thou who art the way, the truth, and the life, hear us as we pray for the truth that shall make all free. Teach us that liberty is not only to be loved, but also to be lived. Liberty is too precious a thing to be buried in books. It costs too much to be hoarded. Help us see that our liberty is not the right to do as we please, but the opportunity to please to do what is right. Amen. In our reading here this morning in Romans, we find that Paul is in a battle. He is battling for his freedom, wrestling and at war with himself. He has the law that's pointing him forward to freedom, but yet he can't break the bonds and the chains a sin that so easily entangled him. He says, I find this law at work that when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. The law that Paul is referring to is the deep-seated root of his Jewish love of the Mosaic Law. It pressed upon Paul this desire for continued obedience, but the more he desired to do what is right, the more he found he failed. Even though he wanted to please God, he kept falling short because his humanness was constantly at war with his godliness. Likewise, we see this, that, that always today, with precious freedom, we still have the marks and the marred stains of sin. We we have it even in our country. I want to look at a couple of the landmark moments of freedom that are still marred with sin. In 1954, there was a landmark Supreme Court decision. It was Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education, which ended segregation in public schools. Did it stop racism? No. But now a lawyer can stand up in a courtroom and he can reference Brown versus Topeka Board, Kansas Board of Education, as a case to legitimize rights today. It was a landmark decision. In 1865, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. It was a landmark decision. 1870, the 15th Amendment gave all men the right to vote regardless of race or color. It was a landmark decision. In 1920, the 19th Amendment gave all women the right to vote. And then 1964, the Civil Rights Act saying that all are free and have the right of equal opportunity to work. Now, I ask the question, does that mean that all of the evils that these decisions were designed to address went away? Absolutely not. We still have the marks of sin. But what it does mean is there's something in the present to refer to in the past as an appeal when mess shows up. Paul writes in Romans 7, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, our appeal. When mess shows up and someone wants to deny a child a right to a public education, 
that he is deserving. A lawyer can reach back to that legal decision made in 1954 to justify undeniable rights. And 2,000 years ago, there was another landmark decision. Jesus Christ hung on a cross between heaven and earth with all of hell watching, and he paid the price for your sin, for my sin, and for the sin of the world. It was a landmark decision. So when Satan comes up to you or to me, and he accuses us that we are not truly free, that we are held in the bondage of our sins, that we need more to make us happy, that you need this, or if only you could have this, you'll be happy, we have an appeal that we say 2,000 years ago there was a landmark decision and all I need is Christ. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about how Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That landmark decision establishes to us that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself as an offering for us. We have an appeal through Jesus. It's why Paul continues in chapter 8, verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. What this means is that we have hope. There is a place to go for all of humanity to go who are welcome to find freedom. In New York Harbor, there stands a lady. She holds a torch in her hand. It gives light and inscribed on the pedestal and where she stands, you find these words. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore Send these homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. You know, we know this woman as Lady Liberty, and she stands there in the harbor with seven spikes on her crown representing the seven seas, the seven continents. And at the bottom of her feet lies a chain that has been broken where she invites all those who have been bruised and tossed and who have been held hostage and in bondage. But the problem is, Lady Liberty, no country, no secular establishment can promise this kind of freedom except God. Jesus is the only one who says, come to me with all your mess. Come to me with all your problems. Come to me with all your burdens. Come to me with your needs. You can come to me because I have the spikes of the crown of thorns. I am the torch, the light of life to show you the way. Jesus holds this promise of freedom to those looking to escape the bondage of sin. He has broken free the chains of sin that lay at his feet of the cross. And he's faithful as the light of the world to continue to show us the way. And there is no condemnation because Christ Jesus, the spirit of life, frees us from the law of sin and death. Paul continues, for what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man. I think about this freedom that we have, and it doesn't come without restrictions. You know, living in America, we have many options in many countries around the world. People are limited. Government or gangs control and people are left without choice. The ability to choose is lost. Freedom is taken. You know, I'm not going to argue the current state of our country or this isn't what the sermon's about. But we have so many freedoms. And we have opportunity. And by principle, at least on paper, we are free to pursue life liberty, and what makes us happy. But we have to have restrictions. You know, think about restrictions in democracy. We can't go into a a bank and demand, well, I'm free, and he has more money than I do, so give me more money. It doesn't work like that. 
Why are there limits to freedom? Let me put it very simply, because there have to be certain restrictions in order that freedom is maximized. A tennis player can't play tennis, is not free to play tennis without the baseline. A baseball player can't play baseball without the foul lines, nor a football player play football without the sidelines. Why are these boundaries in athletic games? Because the game needs to have restrictions to be maximized. The reason God places boundaries in our lives is to create opportunities for us to play under the rules and to truly, fully understand freedom. Paul says, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Now, this is our boundary. Paul is saying he has given us the law, but we can't accomplish this. He said, I can't accomplish this because of my human nature. Paul needed boundaries to keep him from running out of bounds. I think of a football running back. And what's the purpose? He, he's handed the ball, and he needs to get to the touchdown. He needs to get to that end zone. He's got a whole defensive line trying to tackle him. So why not just make it easy, run out of bounds up into the bleachers across the top, and run back down into the end zone and touchdown? That'd be a lot easier. In the same way, we can't run aimlessly out of bounds and think that we can make it through this life and win. John Henry Newman wrote in Apologia, liberty of thought. Liberty of thought is in itself good, but it gives an opening to false liberty. Paul was saying we needed these boundaries of living according to the Holy Spirit to obey the law. And you can't be free without these restrictions, which I'm trying to argue are actually not restrictions at all. Let me use another illustration. A fish is not free to roam the jungle. A lion doesn't swim in the ocean. Why? Because they weren't made for that. Freedom is actually having the benefits due to you which you were created to receive. Freedom doesn't mean no boundaries. Freedom means that within the right boundary, boundaries, we maximize ourself. Paul continues, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. It's like the running back who runs up the stands over and back in to get what he wants, but it doesn't count. You may have the spiritual freedom to run about and do whatever you want, but Paul's saying it doesn't work like that. If you run out of bounds and you set your mind on the things you want of human nature, you're not really playing the game. Like the fish and the lion, we were created for a certain freedom, but with restrictions. We were created to live for God and to worship God. So why... Do we try to be fish roaming in the jungle? Paul says those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. You know, this is the freedom within the boundaries that we were created for. The restrictions set in place to enjoy true freedom, life in the Holy Spirit. And Paul tells us, what is the result if you pursue this life in the Holy Spirit within the boundaries that you obey the law of through the power of the Spirit, he says, it's peace. How we all search for peace, try to find peace, try to create peace, and Paul says, it's only in living in the Spirit. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. We celebrate freedom, but freedom comes with a price. And the price is to keep fighting for future generations that they have freedom. You know, we often hear that statement used to argue for country. But I'm speaking on our spiritual freedom. We aren't really free unless we are fighting for the freedom of others. Matthew 18 is a parable. I want to read this parable because I think it's a call to us today. It says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. 
As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him, be patient with me. I will pay back everything. But the master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him, give me what you owe. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay it all back. But he refused and instead went off, had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. And the master called the servant in and said, You wicked servant, I canceled all of your debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? How could he not offer freedom after he had received it himself? You know, one of the greatest contradictions of the Revolutionary War and freedom still stained with sin is that men fought long and hard to be free, willing to risk their lives in order to escape the tyranny of England. They were able to enjoy wonders of freedom. The irony, however, is that some of these very men who fought for freedom endorsed and even owned slaves. Freemen owning slaves. It's a contradictory when we really think about it. And so cataclysmic was this reality of slavery that it was one of the primary reasons for the Civil War. You see, when we find freedom, how do we not offer it to others? When you've discovered that you've been free, slavery should not even be a word in our vocabulary. What was true of the Revolutionary War is true for us. Freedom is worth fighting for. Freedom is worth risking your life for. There's nothing like being free, but when you find it for yourself, don't let other folks stay in slavery. Paul tells us that Jesus Christ has set us free from the war of sin. Are you free? If you are free, then the question is, are you fighting for that freedom? Are you allowing others to stay captive and oppressed to slavery? the slavery of sin. I don't know if you've ever thought about this parable in this context. Who are we if the king forgives us, but we don't go and share this freedom with others? You know, Jesus Christ represents hope, a beacon of light welcoming all to an eternal land where freedom can be found. At the foot of the cross lays the broken chains. And so... Not that it's bad. I love the 4th of July, but I think about how easy it is to fire up the barbecue and celebrate independence. But why don't we get that excited about the independence won for us in the war of sin through Jesus Christ? What did Jesus quote at the synagogue? He quotes Isaiah 61. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. Proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. You know, Paul realized he couldn't do this on his own, that according to his flesh and according to the law, he failed that he needed the Holy Spirit. Maybe the same is true of us, that we don't really need more fireworks, we need more fire that works. What if we ask the power of the Spirit to come upon us in fire, to light us ablaze and help us truly be free? How many of us need to be released from the sin that entangles us or from the false hope that the devil says, you need this, that we can all say Christ is sufficient? And like the parable, our independence wasn't just won for us, but for the entire world. And so I reflect back, and I am thankful for my independence, and that we do live in a great country, but our citizenship lies in heaven. So I challenge all of us this year, proclaim independence for all through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.